Hello everyone, uh, thank you for stopping by. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Nichols and I am currently a student at Utica College in Microbiology. And this is my end of course presentation on liver flukes and blood flukes. Now these organisms are actually parasitic flatworms of the class Trematoda. And what they do is that they infect human hosts, at least the ones we'll be studying today infect human hosts, and they cause all sorts of infections in the digestive system, mainly the liver, but they can also infect the gallbladder and the pancreas and sometimes the small intestine as well. Now, before we get started, just wanna throw out a couple of disclaimers. Uh, firstly, I am not a scientist and I don't have any background in the medical field. I'm actually a logistician by trade, uh, focusing in product distribution, so this is not my forte. So that being said, uh, if you find that I mispronounced something wrong or I mispresent a piece of information, I'd like you to actually correct me uh, with all of the vitriol of an internet uh, correspondence. And uh, please let me know, because I would like to be corrected if I'm putting out wrong information. I also would like to learn uh, in the process. So here we go on liver flukes and blood flukes. All right, uh, before we get into the meat of the presentation, I just want to give you a bit of a outline here of the agenda. First, going to cover the background. Uh, of the organisms we're going to be focusing on today. We're going to be focusing on the common liver fluke, the Asian liver fluke, and uh, blood flukes. Now, blood flukes have a variety of subspecies that fall underneath them, but we're just going to be focusing on blood flukes in general since they tend to act the same way. Uh, we're going to be covering life cycles and how each organism's mechanism of action or how they go about infecting their hosts. We're also going to talk about the symptoms of each disease, how medical professionals typically diagnose the disease and uh, epidemiology. So how do we control uh, the, the spread of the parasite in its environment? And also how do we treat it uh, when someone presents with a parasitic infection from one of these flatworms? As I previously mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about three main organisms, the common liver fluke, the Asian liver fluke, and the blood fluke. Before I get into the differences between each one, I just want to highlight some uh, basic similarities about these organisms in general. Uh, as you can see, they are quite large. They can be seen with the naked eye. And because of that, they are eukaryotic, meaning that they are multiple celled organisms. And they do have a basic uh, structure since they have rudimentary digestive systems. You can see uh, mainly on the Asian liver fluke and definitely on the blood liver fluke picture on the right, uh, what appears to be a sucker. Uh, and we use these suckers to attach to the host tissue. Uh, in the case of the liver flu, it's the biliary duct and the blood fluke, it's the, uh, the blood vessel lining. And they use this to kind of eat the blood and uh, suck on the tissue of the host. And then they expel that through a rudimentary digestive system that you can kind of see highlighted. Uh, it's been colored slightly on the picture of the Asian liver fluke. Uh, one thing they also have is that they reproduce sexually. So they do have uh, sexual reproductive systems as well. Uh, going to the common liver fluke, this is the largest of the three species that we're going to be talking about. It's by no means the largest trematode, but it is the largest one that we're talking about. So 30 millimeters by 13 millimeters. Uh, something to note about it is that it is actually a hermaphroditic species. So it possesses both uh, sex, care, sex organs, if you will. And uh, this one, uh, when looking at it from the Asian liver fluke, the two are quite similar. Uh, you can see the Asian liver fluke is not as long, but it has a more tapered, uh, narrow body structure. And really the difference between the, these two is in geographic distribution and uh, the life cycles. But in terms of the diseases they cause, they actually cause uh, and infect the host in very similar terms. The blood fluke, on the other hand, uh, is quite different. And you can kind of tell uh, that what you're seeing in the picture on the right is actually two worms. Uh, this, that's a male worm on, that's actually enveloping a female worm and during copulation. So the males are slightly shorter and the females are a little bit longer, they can get up to 20 millimeters long. And so they are sexually dimorphic, meaning that they actually, once they're mature inside the human host, they travel to the mesenteric arteries to breed and produce their offspring. So when looking at the life cycle of the common liver fluke, it actually has quite a flexible life cycle in terms of how many hosts it can infect. So this can infect humans and livestock and any land mammal uh, in general. So when an adult liver fluke matures in the biliary ducts of the liver, it will lay eggs, and then those eggs will be passed uh, into the rectum and excreted out in the feces of the host. Now, if the feces or the eggs manage to find their way to a source of fresh water, they will actually become embernated, and then they'll hatch and form these uh, ciliated spore-type larvae called myricidia. 
and these will actually swim in the water until they find a snail, which will serve as an intermediate host. And inside the tissues of the snail, they undergo a further metamorphosis going from a sporocyst type morphology to they become these free swimming cercicariae, which almost look like tadpoles. And they have this tail and they'll be free swimming. And what they will do is that these will, uh, larva will attach to uh, watercress or any type of water plants ingested by humans or livestock. And they'll attach to the plant and then they'll detach their tail and they'll wait there and they'll wait to be ingested. And then when they are ingested by the host, they will uh, go down the esophagus into the stomach and in the stomach, they will detach from the plant and they will penetrate the lining of the stomach and move through the abdomen until they get to the liver and the biliary ducts. And then they will grow, mature into adults, uh, find another liver fluke, breed and lay more eggs to start the cycle over again. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the life cycle of the Asian liver fluke because it is similar to the common liver fluke, but a couple differences is that they actually have two intermediate hosts. So instead of it being ingested on watercress plants, the Asian liver fluke, once it leaves the intermediate host of the snail, will actually find a fish in the fresh water and then will attach to the fish and again lose their tail and embed themselves in the tissue of the intermediate host. And then when the fish is eaten by humans, because they mainly infect humans, this parasite they will go and proceed to move to the liver in the same uh, action as the common liver fluke. So when looking at the life cycles of the blood fluke as compared to the other liver flukes, the blood flukes are actually quite a bit more mobile in terms of how they infect the host and also how they move throughout the host during various stages of the life cycle. So blood flukes by their nature are sexually dimorphic and dichotomous. And so when the males and females breed, they, depending on the species of the blood flukes, because there are quite a few species, they will move to the certain veins of the hepatic portal system and deposit their eggs either in the feces or the urine. And then these eggs uh, take on slightly different shapes uh, depending on where they are excreted. But it doesn't matter which route they exit the body, uh, they still, once they get to water, will embryonate, uh, form those cicadia, and then penetrate the uh, tissue of a snail as an intermediate host. Where things get a little bit different, uh, when comparing the blood fluke to the liver fluke is that inside the snail they will actually become a sporocyst and then swim out of the snail as a cercariae again with that free swimming tail and instead of finding a intermediate host to be ingested a blood fluke will actually swim up to a human host and penetrate them in the skin so uh, once they do that they will the cercariae will detach its tail and it will move into the bloodstream of the human host and it will stay in the circulatory system until it makes its way to the hepatic portal system, which uh, pretty much supplies and drains blood uh, from the small intestines and the digestive system as a whole. And then once they get to the uh, superior inferior mesenteric arteries, depending on the species, they'll then grow uh, you know, into a male or female blood fluke, find a mate, uh, and then start the life cycle all over again. So once a, a common liver fluke or an Asian liver fluke manages to infect a host successfully, it causes a variety of symptoms. Uh, the liver flukes uh, cause either fasciolysis or clonorchiasis, depending on if it's a common or an Asian liver fluke. But uh, for all intents and purposes, they present the same and they're actually treated the same as well. So once uh, someone manages to be infected by a liver fluke, uh, particularly in the biliary ducts, this is where the liver secretes bile and moves it to the small intestine to digest uh, chyme that comes from the stomach. So the liver flukes, they'll hang out here and they'll cause a variety of damage to the tissues of the liver. One thing to note is that most patients are asymptomatic, uh, but if you do present with symptoms, they're gonna have uh, vomiting and nausea, which aren't really indicative of a parasitical infection. The two symptoms that really stand out is the decreed appetite, uh, appetite and weight loss. That's a key indicator that you may have some sort of parasite that's uh, stealing your nutrients, so to speak. And also jaundice, which is a key sign that there's uh, something wrong with the liver. And of course, jaundice is a yellowing of the skin, and I included a picture and you can particularly see the yellowing of the eyes of this gentleman on the right and how uh, they begin to turn quite yellow. In rare cases, uh, very rare cases, the liver flukes can actually obstruct the bile ducts altogether, and they can also lead to uh, cholangiocarcinoma, which is bile duct cancer. So now looking at blood flukes, if a blood fluke manages to successfully infect a human host, it'll cause uh, symptoms of a disease called schistosomiasis. So most of the symptoms are not caused by the blood flukes themselves, uh, the, with the exception of the rash, uh, but mostly by the circulation of the eggs. So when the eggs circulate inside the body, because these parasites can in fact lay eggs up to 20,000 a day, 
they can cause a bunch of damage to the lining of the bladder and the intestine as they just simply move uh, in circulation. The symptoms that someone will have when uh, diagnosed with this disease are rash, and you can see the pictures on the right of this very uh, spotted rash, and those are actually the parasites from the free-swimming cicariae embedding themselves in the, in the skin and leaving behind that spotted appearance. Uh, other symptoms they may have are fevers and chills and muscle aches. So one thing I forgot to mention about uh, blood flukes and also liver flukes and Asian flukes in general is that these are exceptionally long-lived organisms if they are not caught or, or successfully treated. So liver flukes and blood flukes can manage to stay inside the human host for upwards of 25 to 30 years. So if they successfully do that, they can present uh, further chronic complications such as in a large liver, uh, particularly blood in the stool and urine, quite easy to do with those eggs damaging the lining of the intestine. And in quite rare cases, what these eggs can do is they can make their way into the spinal cord and kind of contaminate the cerebral spinal fluid. And this can cause a variety of paralysis or also spinal cord inflammation symptoms. So thankfully diagnosing a infection from a common liver fluke or an Asian liver fluke is actually quite simple. The easiest thing to do is to take a stool sample of the patient and to view if there are any microscopic eggs. Um, some cases you can actually view the adults via an ultrasound image, which I included a example of off to the right. Uh, the tricky part comes if the patient has been infected with the parasite, but they actually haven't gotten to the point where they're reproducing and passing eggs in the stool. So thankfully, there are a number of tests that you, you can use that would actually see uh, if there is some sort of infection going on, mainly in the liver. Uh, first one is a simple blood test. You can see if there's elevated white blood cells or uh, specific T cells or antibodies. Uh, another a test you can do is a liver function test. So the liver function test, uh, they'll look for various levels of enzymes in the liver, uh, mainly alkaline phosphatase and also bilirubin. Uh, bilirubin is a very important uh, chemical that comes from heme, uh, from broken down hemoglobin, from red blood, cells, red blood cells that have been recycled by the liver. So if these levels are particularly off, it's a good indication that there's a problem and infection with the liver as well. Uh, when diagnosing a blood fluke infection, uh, it's quite simple. You can actually do the same procedures of viewing the eggs in a stool sample or in the urinalysis as well. Uh, again, if the eggs are not being laid by the organisms because they're simply too young and haven't infected the host as long, uh, you can do a blood test as well and test for elevated antibodies. And blood flukes in particular, uh, when they're inside the host, the body will produce specific antigens in response to the parasite. So if you look and you see these antigens within the blood, it's a key indication that you have been infected by a blood fluke. So when looking at the epidemiology of the common liver fluke, it actually has the widest geographic distribution of 50 countries, but it only has affected 2 million people, uh, mainly because it causes most damage to livestock and agriculture. But still, the highest rates of human infections occur in the Andean highlands of South America, particularly in Peru and Bolivia. Um, so in order to actually successfully reproduce, it requires fresh water and the prevalence of snails, and it needs to be a quite a bit warmer environment as well. So we simply control for this. Number one, the easiest measure is to boil and clean your vegetables uh, while cooking them, and also to not eat vegetables grown in uh, essentially pastures. And if you eat the organs of these infected hosts, you can actually, the liver flukes will just simply move from their liver to yours. So even though the Asian liver fluke has a smaller geographic distribution, it is still quite large, um, prominent in East Asia and Russia. And in fact, 15 million people, uh, this is the most up-to-date statistic I could find, were infected in 2004. So obviously it requires a number of things, mainly the fresh water, you have to have the snails there, and of course the intermediate host of the fish as well. So this is a, quite a common traveler's disease where tourists will go to these East Asian countries and then they'll sample local cuisine and catch a parasite by happenstance. So there are a bunch of ways to take care of this parasite. The simplest wish is just completely cooking the fish. But another way, a control factor, is that they'll actually treat these fresh waterways to exterminate the snails. And this is actually common with the common liver fluke as well. So if you take out the snail species, then you just simply stop the life cycle from reoccurring. So the blood fluke is mainly prevalent in East Asia and Africa. And there are quite a few cases, uh, 200 million of them so far. And this requires a temperate temperature and also the prevalence of snails and fresh water. So the people who are most at risk are people who tend to swim or live and bathe in these rivers. And so the best way to control it is 
obviously just treating the water to eliminate the snails. But if you simply just boil your water or treat your water before you bathe in it, or you just avoid swimming in local waterways, you'll reduce your risk of contracting the parasite. So since uh, liver flukes and blood flukes are related and have similar body structures to a certain extent, they can actually be treated with the same medications. Uh, the most common treatment is oral medication. Uh, the, probably the biggest and most well-known uh, parasitical medication is uh, praziquantanel. So what this does is it affects the permeability of the parasite's membrane. And so what this will do is it'll cause the, the worm or the flatworm to leak, and then eventually it can't retain water, it'll dehydrate and die. Uh, there are a number of other medications that do the same thing, such as bithionol. And then another medication uh, that's more used worldwide is uh, triclobendazole. And this one is actually got to start uh, as a cattle medication. So it is does have agricultural uses in the U.S., but to my knowledge, I do not believe it's available for human uh, use in the U.S. and Canada. Now, surgical removal is rare, uh, but it does happen from time to time. So I did include a picture of this is a common liver fluke being removed from a uh, bile duct in the liver by a set of forceps. So this wraps up my presentation on liver flukes and blood flukes. Um, just looking at my references, most of my data came from the Center for Disease Control. If you have any other questions uh, that I had not properly answered for you on these types of parasites, I highly recommend you uh, checking out their website. It's got a lot of information that was quite useful. Um, again, thank you so much for stopping by and take care.